rest is a gift from God. No man has a right to take it away from you. Tonight if I share and what I share makes you anxious, takes away your right to rest, I'm no more a minister of the Prince of Peace. <laughs> Do you understand that? No more. People started checking out in Nigeria. I was a young man then. We had an advert then. There was a guy called Andrew. He says, guys, I'm checking out, man. Can't take this nonsense. It was an advert on NTA. I'm checking out. Andrew checked out. So you call it Jaqua. We called it Andrew. Andrew, check out. I'm checking out, man. Yeah. I also checked out. <laughs> I convinced my wife that it was time for us to find newer pasture. You see? Come, come, come. I convinced my wife it was time to move to greener pasture. And I got to England. I checked out. And we agreed that once I settled and I sort out everything, then she can resign her job and join me. She was an accountant. She, was, she had a job. She was, Do your work in Nigeria. You know, that's a safety net. You know, the generation that thinks safety is amazing. Because the Bible leaves up for us a verse of scripture that says, in vain is a horse prepared for the day of battle. Why? Safety is of the Lord. <laughs> me. Are you a chief? You know, I like your cap. The way you wore it, like one every bad chief. I want you to come back into the service. That when you prepare a horse for battle, no matter what you wear on the horse, it's vanity. Because the actual safety and the result of the battle is of the Lord. So I was working in a fast food shop, a restaurant. It's called McDonald's. I was working by a train station. A major train station in the city of London, very hard of the city. And around 2 a.m., because I, I couldn't walk during the day because of shame. You know, Nigeria, you are still proud. You are still you are a poor, proud man. I've checked out because I believed I was coming from a poor place and I'm going to a rich place. But when I got there now, okay, to sweep the train station, knowing that Neka might just be boarding the early morning train. Say, ah, Baba. <laughs> so I couldn't work during the day. So I found a night job. And I was a chemist. Our job was to wash the milkshake machine. It, it takes chemistry to do it. I you know, became a scientist. What I hated in secondary school, chemistry, mathematics, etc. I was now doing it by force. Because there were tiny needles. If you don't put them in place properly and they, you know, you just destroy the machine. And I was living in a country where the people eat. 5 a.m., they are by the door in a queue, ready for breakfast. Not to come in for you to start cooking it, but to buy cooked breakfast. They walk all night. It's not the same culture like here, you know. Here we sleep. All, I mean, people walk from 7.30 to 3.30 and enjoy from 3.30 till the next 7. You know, we just have fun. I didn't know what I was leaving and where I was going to and what I was embracing. Listen to my stories because we'll tell largely stories tonight. And my manager was an 18-year-old little Jamaican British girl. Can you imagine? I have a degree. She didn't go to secondary school. But because she's British, and I don't have any papers. I was mopping the floor. 
I had cleaned that floor in my eyes. You can pour rice and beans with meat and eat it on that floor. And the girl came, started cursing me. What the F do you think you are doing? What the freaking F do you think? You silly, nasty what? And she was dropping her cigar, cigar ash on the floor that I had mopped. I was at least twice her age. From the ground when I looked at her, I thought of giving her back hand <laughs> and how it will carry her up, suspend her for a few minutes, then drop her down. You know those kind of slaps that your mother used to give? My mother was wicked. She would give you one slap like this, but what you will hear is tawai. Do you have mothers like mine? My mother was wicked. I told her she's in heaven now, and I told her every day I preach, I must disgrace you. That's the only way to get back at her. My mother was tall and big. If she stands by the door, darkness falls inside the room. So, because I was tricky, when I've done something wrong, I avoid being sent to the room. Because she can block the door and lock it. So, and my mother was cunning, Kai, like a witch. She would say to me, My baby has hair. She said, Come on, go and buy me Maggie. I'll go and buy it and go. Go and buy me salt. In my mind, that means she has forgiven and forgotten. She would say, Come bring your hand. And she would tap the soup spoon. I say, lick it. Is the salt okay? I say, no. She say, okay, add. You are the one who knows the quantity because you are my taster. <laughs> then she told me, go and fetch me water from inside for me to add to the water. Then when I enter the room, I remember, you shouldn't be here alone. And I just see a pillar of darkness. She's already by the door. That's when you see me on my knees. I repent. She said, no, 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 no. You don't know the meaning of the word repent. Bye. She said, to repent, you did it on Monday. You stole it on Tuesday. On Wednesday, you still stole me. Today again, you have still stolen. No, when you repent, you will make a U-turn and begin to go in the opposite direction of where you used to go. So Chris, when they came to preach to me in church, it wasn't difficult for me to understand repentance. It's not what they taught her. It's what my mother has been saying. You can't be a thief on Sunday, thief on Monday, thief on Tuesday, and say you are repenting. No, no, no. Repentance is if you are going to Aja, you make a U-turn and begin to go back exactly the same way you came, the opposite direction. So for me, I had a clear picture of what repentance meant. And I, I was here, and this girl was cursing me. And I couldn't do anything. Because I didn't have papers. I had checked out. I believed that this economy was finished. I believed that there was no recovery. I believed there was no good thing coming out of this place. And this was 1989. And then she walked out. And the Lord said, oh yeah, clean the cigar ash man of God, I cleaned the cigar ash and couldn't complain. And then the Lord said, what do you want to say? I said, did you just see what that girl did? And you told me to clean the ash after her. Cigar where no smoke. And the Lord said, why are you angry? I said, I had a better lot in Nigeria before coming here. She cannot even be my messenger. To be honest, where I was. The Lord said, eh, but who sent you? You came now. So I said, yes, I was checking out. It's a trend. Everybody's checking out in Nigeria. The Lord said, come out. I want to talk to you. Then I got up. And I went out. And when I got outside, I cannot forget how 
the sky looked. See, I'm here now. I can see almost every hue of light that we have in place. That day, the sky was looking orange. And the song I heard was what we used to sing in the Boy Scouts. London's burning, London's burning. Gentlemen, there was a London fire. And so that song was sung. And then Boy Scouts used to sing it. You know, when we do bonfires, we sing London is burning. I, I, I was too sure there was a fire all over London. And I, I said, I've warned these people who some of those buildings are made of wood. And one day, eh, fire will all burn this place down. But it wasn't London burning. And I thought, okay, it was the electric lamps. It wasn't. There was a glow in the sky. See, when God speaks to you, he speaks to you in words that describe the past, the present, but that also project the future. It's amazing. If you're just careful, you will know God. I was looking forward to speaking to young believers, people who have just said yes to Jesus tonight. It's very important. And I was looking forward to people who have believed in him, but have also come to the need to find in another place where they can be saying yes to him afresh. That's people who have this unquenchable hunger, unconquerable hunger, and a need to taste adventure with God. That's what I was hoping for. And while we're coming, I said to Vicky, when you say, I wish this would happen, or I hope that would happen, what you're actually saying is, I have a burden, the burden of the Lord. I said, and he grants the burdens. So I pray the prayer today that the Lord will unite our hearts so that we'll hear the same thing, drink from the same river, run the same race, and take off with the same wings to the same height and explore in the same direction have a hunger in the same measure so when I say same measure doesn't mean you are desirous of four cups of rice and she's desirous of four cups no 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 the same measure means if all you can handle is one cup and the measure means you are looking for maybe one and a half do you understand me more than what you want because when he anoints you he fills your cup until it's running over. That's my prayer tonight. So I stood there looking at the glow. And he said to me, what are you doing in this land? So I answered him, you know Nigeria is going to bits, shattering. Any moment from now, 1989, I just got married in December. And this was January, and I took off. Then he let me be there for some months before he came that night. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said to him, because of the obvious impending disintegration of Nigeria and the dereliction of her economy and systems, I blew grammar for him. And he listened to me. I said, so I took off here and me and my wife have agreed so that he will know that there is agreement. He's the one teaching me the things I'm using against him. He said, every time you agree, that's what's called marriage. What's your name, sir? Huh? I can't hear you now. You can't call it louder than that. Huh? Again? Cheta, that one on your face, your, your t-shirt. But, but you sounded like Cheta. So I was wondering, what are you saying? So if your wife is here now, how will she hear you? I know you are the one. When you can't even call your name out. Sit down. Listen to me. This is the second time I said listen to me. So God had told me, it's the things he taught me, Cheta that I was using against him. He had told me that when you marry a girl, 
that what is called marriage is agreement. That if we wake up in the morning and we say, honey, what shall we have this morning? And she says, conflicts. And I say, oh, that sounds good. Let's have it. That we have just done marriage. Do you understand that? That's marriage. Boom, boom. <laughs> that if she says, let's have conflicts. And I say, yes. And she starts preparing it. And I say, no, I'm not going to eat conflicts. I change. You have your conflicts. And I go, off. I'm breaking marriage. Because marriage is agreement. And in agreeing, we must go 50-50. I come 50% of the way, you come 50% of the way. So you leave your position, your hard position. I leave my hard position. And we agree that that middle course where we meet is marriage. Marriage is done and the name of the Lord is glorified. Now this definition of marriage is true for friendships. Because there is marital friendships. When you say, this is my friend. As far as God is concerned, what you are saying is, I'm married to this position. Do you understand? That's the reason why when you become disloyal to a relationship, the other person, his heart is broken or her heart is broken because you are breaking marriage. That's why we go to extents just to protect our marital positions. Do you understand me? If you say something nasty about my friend, I get upset because you are talking about my friend to whom I'm married. So the Lord said to me, what are you doing here? And I told him, I said, we agreed with my wife that we would relocate out of Nigeria and find a better, greener pasture. And this is where we chose England. And God said to me, he had the words, the reason for which I apprehended you do you know apprehended? It's capture, bab. And Hausa is chubke. The reason why I chub called you. <laughs> he said, it's not here. It's at home. Get up and get out or I'll kill you. Now, why did God say to me, or oh, I'll kill you? People are very religious. They don't think God can say, I will kill you. He said it to Moses. Do you get it? I'll tell you why he said it to me. My mother is a terror in my life. You know how you put a magnet on your papers, on your table, so that the fan doesn't blow it away, yeah? You know that, yeah? You put a bottle or you put something carrying some weight, so it keeps your papers from the wind blowing them away, isn't it? Now that's how my mother has become in my life. So my mother drilled every discipline into me. That's why she's telling you her mother was her pastor. Do you understand that? Her first pastor. Very people, very few people have x-rayed their lives that, like that. To be able to stand and tell you, this is where I started. This is where I entered. This is where I am now. And until you can say that, nothing exceptional is going to come out of you. And of what you are doing. So my mother drilled so much and so many things inside my life. You know. My mother drilled a lot of things inside my life. And later, I found out that these were scriptural things the poor Baptist woman was teaching. They were poor Baptist things. I mean, scriptural things. But she was doing them to the best of her ability. And the best of our ability included kicks, punches, and slaps. And it was necessary because I was a rascal. So monkey no de born good. She knew what she gave birth to. So she had to beat the thing out. You know, most of the times parents want to beat you to line up with what they failed to line up with. Do you understand me? A father beats you because he sees himself and he wished that he had listened to those things when he was younger. So he's actually sparing you his shame and giving you a game that will make you excel beyond where he got to. And we're always upset. One day my junior brother said to my mother, don't be talking to me anyhow. I'm, I'm 16. And she said, oh, 
Thank God you are 16. Me, I stopped growing. Do you understand? You know, when we looked at we look at ourselves and you are 18, 20, what do you tell the truth? Do you think your mother grew? You don't now. That's why our, our mothers and fathers die suddenly on us. Because when our mothers are dying, we don't even notice. We are still telling her, hey, Mommy, didn't you cook anything? <laughs> and it is that labor that is killing her. Do you understand me? And she's shielding it from you. She's shielding her slow process of dying because she's insisting to do exactly what you want. You're always her baby. Do you get that? We sat with my father and a doctor and the doctor checked my father, checked his BP, checked him. My father, meticulous headmaster. He would wear long socks to his knees and put his biros there. Do you understand me? Red and black. <laughs> He would cut his hair and do a parting there. He wore brogues, English brogues, solid shoes. One of the few to own a bicycle in the community. He would ride the bicycle from my village to Joss to go and teach. And children would gather on the road from community to community, hailing them as they are passing with their bicycles. They put little, little pins on the wheels so that when the bicycle is moving, the flags made of leather, are flapping through the rim. And you hear, ta, 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 ta. and we, we thought, my, <laughs> that's our father's bicycle. And this was the man we were sitting with the doctor with. And the doctor checked him, checked his BP, checked his eyes, checked everything. I said to him, Baba, I really thank God because you are all right. Then the doctor, my dad said, doctor, he said, yes. He said, you checked my head, you checked my back, you checked, you listened to my lungs, you checked this hand, but you have not checked this hand. So I said to him in horror, why are you disgracing us now? What kind of question is that? You know what? In my mind, I thought my dad was 60. In fact, I thought he was 40. That sharp, agile, astute teacher. You get what I'm saying? Very spot on. My dad would never make such a statement. He's below him. You know, my dad was well-traveled, well-read, well-knowledged. Knowledgeable. He didn't travel far. I'm talking of northern Nigeria. He traveled very well. I know some of you, when I say traveled, you think he went to Cameroon. When he was to go to Cameroon for one conference, we sold two brand new Agbada for him, just for that conference. He's going abroad. Where? Cameroon. <laughs> then they told, told him that they speak French there. So he said, oh, what is he going to be saying? We said, bonjour. He said, what's that? <laughs> you know. Then I said to him, why are you talking like that? He said, well, the doctor checked this hand. I said, no, they drew blood from this hand. He said, he should have checked this hand too. So the doctor made a comment about his age. I said, ah, Baba, is, uh, you need to understand. So I didn't like that. Then I took his card and I saw his age. 94. I didn't know. I thought my dad was 30. So I said to him, are you really up to 90? He said, you, how old are you? So I was 40. He said to me, eh, so add that to my age when I had you. Then it occurred to me, man, this guy, this might be the last visit we'll have with the doctor. And I've not done anything for him. I bought him a pair of shoes. And I brought the shoes to him. And he wore them. My dad is a very thankful guy. And he said, oh, thank you. I love the shoes. They remind me of 1940-something. Ah. Because they were like the brogues he used to wear. They were bought from a street in London called Edgware Road. It was the go-to place then for leather. You know, snake skin, leopard skin shoes. You know, every kind of shoe. Skin, rather. 
I bought correct British brooks for him. And then he wore them where he was sitting. He didn't stand up. So we had to help him wear them. And tied the laces. Then after a while, I followed my mom out and I was harassing her in the kitchen. And when I came back, he left the shoes by the chair there. And I didn't see him. I thought he went to the restroom. So I, I was unhappy. He should be wearing the shoes everywhere. That's what he normally will do. I went inside and I found him sleeping. I came back and asked his wife, what's wrong with your husband? She said, like what? I said, the shoes I bought for him. Doesn't he like them? She said, ah, he loves, did you hear he was celebrating you, his son and everything? I said, but he left them by the chair and went inside. She said, go inside and ask him now. You are his party. Ask him why. If he doesn't like it, you know why now. Then you can change it. So I went inside and I said, Mr. G. He said, yeah. I said, ah, what are you doing? He said, he just felt like sleeping and resting a little so he can get up and gist with me some more. I said, don't you like the shoes I bought for you? He said, I love them. Ah. He said, those are the kind of shoes I used in toasting your mom that time. She couldn't resist me. And my mom would be saying, hmm, don't mind him. <laughs> you know, and they are using me to toast again. Then I said, no, but why did you leave them? It's not like you. You would have worn them even to sleep on the bed. I'll be happy. You get what I'm saying? And he said to me, he said, ah, no, they are too heavy. They are too heavy. But this is the time when I want to reward you for being my father. And my gifts are too heavy. So now, when I go to buy shoes, I have to weigh them to look for the kind of weight that he would wear. Now that's what happens when time creeps up on you. Suddenly, your mom, you buy her suya, and she would normally be excited but you can't eat it now because the doctors have said, know this, know that, know that. Why does life always terminate at such a point when you can't reward those who deserve the reward that you carry? We all labor looking for that time, forward to that time, isn't it? One would bless them. So parents die suddenly on children because the, the children continuously exploit the strength and many of the times that strength has become weakness of their parents without regard to studying time and suddenly they wake up and find out that I'm 40 but that means mommy had me when she was 40 that means today she's 80 we're in a hurry to say I've grown up and we forgot that they had grown up and started growing down because of the burden of carrying us. I'm saying this tonight, so maybe, you know, it's a word of knowledge. Someone's going to get, get out of church and call their mom, call their dad and chat with them. Stop saying my mom is always disturbing me with useless chat. And then she want me to stay on the phone for 30 minutes as if I don't have work. Now that's the only reward you can give. Anyway, back to my story. So, 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 I was out there in London and the sky was orange. It was like the city was burning. So the sky was on fire. And the Lord said to me, the reason for which I did what? Apprehended you. Hear that word. It's like I arrested you. It's like I, I felt trapped. Like an animal that was trapped, caged and captured. That was the word. I didn't know it was in the Bible. It was later when I studied Acts of the Apostles and then studying Paul that Paul began to talk of it. He apprehended me. I've been following him to ask him why he apprehended me. And that suddenly made me feel trapped. For indeed you are trapped when Jesus captures you. It's a trap. You want to do your things. But then you realize that although he saved you from sin, redeemed your life from destruction, took you from the miry clay and put your feet upon the rock to stay, whatever the poetry is, you suddenly realize that you were set free to become a slave to this new form of freedom. That's the meaning of the word Jesus 
unhindered. And you struggle with it. And he breaks you through a process of slow attrition. Slowly scraping your rights. Until he leaves you without a right. And all you want to do is willingly serve, talk, magnify, decorate, celebrate his majesty. So many of us, I'm in your place today, I'm in your place tonight, first time believers who are just coming into this thing. And you found this place and a fountain is flowing. But that fountain, the moment it hits the borders of the door, wherever we use as a meeting place, its intention is to find new pathways by which it will flow because it intends to go around the entire earth. The original river in Eden, we don't know its name, but the streams that broke out, we know their names. The Euphrates, Hidekel, just like a family. A man may stand and he will not be known. But then very soon you hear his name on the radio, on the television. Hussein Bolt! Hussein Bolt! Hussein Bolt! is Hussein Bolt. It's Hussein that is running the race. But the name is Hussein and who? Bolt. It's only later when the story is told that you find Bolt, a Jamaican. Do you understand me? sitting down, already tired with age, but he's the one that raised that boy. So wherever the boy takes the flags of Jamaica to, he advertises Jamaica, advertises Mr. Bolt. Are you following me? But he's the one doing the exercises. He's the one suffering the injuries. It is his muscles that are tearing. It is his bones that are breaking when he overstresses himself in exercise, preparatory to breaking the world record. But he's called who? Hussein Bolt. So the victory of the kingdom is her sons. Do you understand me? Wherever your name goes, the kingdom follows. That's the plan. Do you get that? Barack Obama. But he's not Obama. Obama is a Kenyan. Do you understand me? Obama named him Barack. Obama brought him to America and put him in the system. Of course, we all know the journey for illegal migrants. There's something crooked at the beginning, but the system ends up swallowing you. And then Barack one day becomes president of America. But he cannot be called without the mention of Obama. How Obama ended, where he died, where he's buried is no more important. Except if Barack goes there to celebrate his dad, the whole world's attention will be there. That's what Jesus unhindered is. It's a church. When, when a man is called like Abraham, come out of your country, come out of your people, that's the church started. And every church has a context and nature in which it is birthed. So you take nothing that doesn't belong to you, only take what belongs to you. Everyone has an identity in the call. He said to Moses, I'm about to reveal myself to you with a name that nobody else before you has ever known. I've never told anybody to call me by that name, but you, I will tell you to call me by that name. And it's the name Adonai. Adonai. Moses said, what does it mean? It means Lord, yes. But what does Lord mean? It's too much grammar. Let me break it down to you and bring it home. What's your name, sweetheart? What? Eh? Eh, that's better. You sounded better than Cheta. At least this way a guy can catch you as a dream. Because she called her name properly. So he can say Busola. Busola. In his sleep. Busola. Busola. You know? <laughs> Busola. She's just Bus Busola who? Momo. Busola Momo. When I meet her, it will be Busola Momo. 
That's her name. So, Busola, how are you? Fine, thank you. That's all. Her brother will say, my younger sister. Do you understand? That's how he knows her. My big sister. That's how he knows her. One day, another guy will come and say to her, I love you. Do you love me? And she says, yes. And he starts calling her sweetheart. He doesn't want to call her name again. Because if he calls her name, it will connote he doesn't own her. Do you understand me? But what he really wants to do is to advertise his relationship, his possessional grip over her by telling everybody, she's my babe. They say, who is your babe? He says, Busola. The brother will say, Busola. Ke. Do you understand me? Because she's close to him in a different way and he takes her for granted. But this new guy is a suitor. What he's seeing is children seeing a solid home, a fortified identity into the future. So he's calling her babe, my darling, my sweetheart. That's the meaning of the word Lord. They say, who is that? He says, my father. But if he's really your father, what do you call him? Daddy. Dad, my daughter has a code. I believe she inherited Juju from her grandmother. Because anything my daughter wants, she gets it from me. And how does she get it, P.I.? The way she calls me. My daughter has lived in England. She's gone all over the world. She can speak any kind of English. American English, British English, Nigerian English. Any English she can speak. But when she comes to call me, and she wants something from me, and the thing is as precious as my life, she that thing. It sounds like bells. Like, do you understand me? The girl. One day, flowers came from another country to celebrate her birthday. So I said, ah, you don't get flowers from across the Atlantic. Let me say, you are ready to move to somebody's house. But when she wants to call me, she doesn't call me like a mature babo campus girl. You understand what I'm saying? Like a friend of so 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 no. She comes back to that two year old girl. Tatin. And I just melt. At that point, the only thing I cannot give her is her mother. <laughs> no, do you understand what I'm saying? But everything I have is hers. You know, you keep getting upset when you see girls very close to their fathers. Don't worry, your turn is coming. It's turn by turn. There's just a way Bumi calls me. The moment she calls me, a virus wakes up. And I just begin to scream. And she's screaming on the other side. I don't even know what her husband is thinking. I don't know what everybody around me is thinking. Then she will accuse me that I'm the one that makes her. Meanwhile, she's the one infecting me with the virus. And she'll do it in the night and do it early in the morning, do it in the afternoon and do it anytime she wants. It's just the way they call him. So call, 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 call. People don't do these kinds of things cheaply. The call. Today I will just be free, can I? <laughs> As if you can hinder me. It's too late. You are committed to not hindering Jesus. Everybody, his assignment, you will know. So the call, what does the call sound like? Bumi. She asked me a question yesterday. That, oh, is that you? Come, 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 come. Push one. If you didn't come with Sarah, I will not welcome you. It's like I knew that visitors were coming. So, what is the call? These kinds of assignments, they're not cheap. Is a call. I'm telling you my own call. 
I stood there and he said, the purpose for which I called you is not, I apprehended you, he's not here, he's at home. Get up and get back home or I'll kill you. Now listen, why did he use those words? Is God a killer? It's your business, who? Me, I know he's a killer. You know why? It is the language my mother used to use. I'm not the kind of person that reasons. I don't know, I hear people teaching in your generation. Ah, don't beat your children. Speak to them. If you beat them, you subject their reason. Speak to them so that they can become reasonable and can go, hey, me. You want to speak to me? When my mother says, drop that thing, I will just be looking at her. Like, who are you talking to? Until she carries pistol. What she's using to pound the arm. When she leaves, drop it or I'll kill you. Then I will look at the pistol. Imagine the thing that will happen to my head when it lands. Then I will drop the knife and stand up. Every time my mother wanted me to do something, she had to add all. In fact, one day, one of my greatest jokes in the beer parlor was an old jo all jo joke. They said they had an Amala joint, a pounded yam joint. So one skinny guy came and stood on the queue for over an hour and it wasn't his turn because people were choosing meat. Uh huh, yes, come, yes. Uh, eti, come, yes, yes. Ah, ese babankano, meji. Yeah, yeah. Oh, come, yes, yes, yes. You know, my mother, how did you hear that I'm in town? Buki, sit down. I love you. <laughs> Do you get that? So the boy was standing on the queue. And he got tired. And then one hefty guy, bully, walked in, sat down on a table, cleared the, chair, the plates that were there and just arranged a space for him. He said, Ambrose. So the guy serving the food said, Ah, Jumbu, you will give me two eba. Ogbana soup without. That means he didn't have money for meat. So give me the eba Ogbana soup without. And do it quickly. Or so Ambrose said, ah, no problems now. Then he left the people who were on the queue and went and served Jumbo. So this guy felt angry. Now boy, like me. In fact, I told Pasa, boy, you be like spaghetti. Jumbo, if you see an Iroko. So this guy too left the queue and went and sat down. Ambrose! <laughs> Ambrose! Give me three pounded here, two meat, and one coke. Oh! So Ambrose left the kitchen and came and stood in front of him and said, Oh, what? <laughs> Whatever you want to do, do it now. My mother used that word, oh. That when I heard this story, it became one of my favorite jokes. Everywhere I get drunk, I must tell the story of awe. Oh. God doesn't speak to you a language that doesn't, re doesn't resonate with your being. So I disobeyed my mom to the point that until you tell me awe, oh, then I will compare the repercussion and the action. Then I will, I will, I will do it. So he said to me, get out of this country. Get back home. Oh, I'll kill you. When he spoke, it was my mother I heard. Two weeks, I was out of England. In fact, the two weeks I had already worked in the McDonald's. I didn't even wait to collect the salary. The girl had to follow me home and was apologizing, thinking that the way she spoke to me was what made me yari that I don't even want my money. Me, Nigerian. Pound sterling. Even if you like, cost my father. Just give me the money. Abi. Afterwards, I'll use the money to wash away the cost. <laughs> you know, so you talk. Fella sang a song, he said, slap me, make I get money. Ah, it was number one. I left. I left England in snow, in winter. I wore layers of clothes. I didn't come out of the aircraft in Kano. I was peeling all the layers until I left the sleeveless t-shirt that was inside. Sweating. And I asked myself, what are you doing in this God-forsaken land? It's a compulsion. It's a call. You hear the story of 
the Philistines that they captured the Ark of the Covenant, isn't it? And then cancers broke out on all their male private parts. And then the people decided this Ark that we captured, this little box that four people carry conveniently. If the Ark was heavy and the four people that carry the Ark always ended up with swollen shoulders every day, will they be carrying it? So the ark was just a simple box and these four men could carry it conveniently daily for months, for years. So the Philistines were of two camps. It is clear that this thing in our presence is what's causing this trouble. Others said, eh, we have proven it, but isn't that giving too much credit to the Israelis. After all, if it was, if the ark is that powerful, how come we defeated them? You know, be careful with the little, little victories you have. They can misdirect, mystify, and blur God. So pray prayer tonight. Oh Lord, no matter how big and sweet or how small and tiny and tidy the victory is, help me that when I am out of sync, help me to realize and help me to return. It will save me and those who hear me. What am I enjoying tonight? So I returned. And the first Christians that met me said to me, Ah, why are you back? When are you going back? I said, No, this is what the Lord told me. And they turned around and told themselves, This guy is mad. God cannot take you to the land flowing with milk and honey and ask you to return to the land of thorns and thistles and briars. Really? Really? God doesn't want his children to grow up among thorns? Have you read the Bible? What is the highest prophecy in the Bible? Speaking to his son. A root, tender shoot, out of where? Dry ground. And when we looked at him, we didn't esteem him to have anything. We esteemed him as rubbish. The reason is because the challenges were too hard for him to overcome. Every challenge Jesus faced was too hard for him to overcome. One day the Lord had to take me to a farm. I found it. And there were tender shoots of little, little corns. Just like an inch and a half. Lord said, check, 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 check them. So I checked them. They were all standing, tender shoots, green. They all had one character, P.I. At the base where they entered the ground, they had cracked the ground into like four or five little streams. Do you understand me? But if you push them with your finger, they'll break. As tender as they were, they caused an earthquake. Because that's an earthquake. Whether you agree with it or not, every time a shoot comes out, it cracks the earth. It forces its way out. But when you look at it, it's at its tenderest. That's why he advises you, do not despise the days of small beginnings. God never does anything big. Starts it. The moment you start things big, the only way they need to go is back down. Because there is no room to grow. See, growth must be earned. That means when you get to a level, you must be able to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can handle it. What you can't handle. It's not growth. We are entering Lagos like this. Like a tender shoot. It's a lie. It's a giant. <laughs> These seasons of tenderness, we are gathering info that will help us take care of thousands in one pond there, thousands in another pond. We'll have many fish ponds, and all those fish ponds will be nurturing places for fingerlings, for young fish, for mature fish. Jephthah, is that you? Oh my God. I told you, it's church. So 
So the Philistine set of the ark carried by two milking cows whose breasts are filled with milk every so often that they are so heavy the cows can't carry it and their nipples are so extended that they are in pain. They wish the little lambs will come and suckle the weight off. And they tied their babies in the crowd. And they said, if the cows can stop dragging this cart just to feed their babies, then it means the power in this box is not what is causing trouble for us. The babies were lowing, shouting, mommy, mommy. And the cows were lowing and saying, yes, I'm here, but I cannot help myself. And they kept going towards Beth Shemesh, the direction of Israel. The ark and whoever was in it knew home. Do you understand that? And the Philistines said, truly, this is God. He was the one fighting us. Now, they are not used to gods that are alive. Joseph met Potiphar's wife. And according to Hebrew mythology, that's not in the Bible. Though. They said that one day Joseph was entering to take care of the shrines of Potiphar, where all his gods are. And nobody enters it carelessly. So Potiphar's wife met him. And that she had only a wrapper. And she was naked inside. And she said to Joseph, sleep with me. And she opened the wrapper so he can see her body. Because you know, men are turned on by what they see. And Joseph said, no, I can't do that and hurt my God and my master. And she said, which God? Then she removed the wrapper and put it on all the gods and covered their faces. She said, they can't see. Then Joseph said to her, no, no, no. There is one. Even if you lock all the doors, he sees. So that was why they gave him the name Zaphonat Panea. Because there's a God who sees. For the Jews, for the Egyptians, it was strange. <laughs> God. We, we carved him out of wood. We put the eyes there. And if I cover him with my wrapper, he can't see anything. Let's just do it. And he said, no, no. There's the one who sees and hears and knows omnipotent, omniscient. Why he is omniscient and knows everything is because he sees all and hears all and everything is done in his presence. According to Hebrews, he says there is nothing that is naked, I mean that is not visible, evident before him. Everything is. So for them, this was a discovery. Now listen to me, Bumi. There in that story lies the mystery of what's called a miracle. Now, all of us like to go to places where miracles happen. But miracles don't happen to show God's power. <laughs> God doesn't need to show his power. He doesn't need it. Before you were created, he had defeated all his enemies. There's no enemy left to fight him. So God has no ego problem. Oh Lord, heal some blind eyes tonight that we may know that you are God. Don't know. I'm telling you. Do you understand me? They say God is good. Receive him. You say no, I don't. See, as you die, you'll be standing in front of him. Say, I'm sorry, sir. I wasted the life you gave me. I used to wake up in the morning and instead of doing this, you, you would tell him everything you did because he owns it. Do you know that the breath that is on the inside of you, whether you are a believer or not, is God's breath? No, that scared me when I found out. Because you know what that implies? In adultery, in stealing, in lying, you are sinning together with God. Because he gave himself to you. That was scary. Malice. You are doing it with him. I'm not going to greet him. I won't greet her. Who does she think she is? You are doing it with the Spirit of God. Because he breathed his breath into you. He gave you himself so you can live. You will not realize it until you stand in front of him. 
and every man will stand before God and every eye will see your period with God. That will be your greatest day of glory, even if it is glorious shame. Because every eye will see you when you stand before God and he's going to say to you, get thee behind, get, get, thee, get, get away from me, you wicked and unfaithful servant. Or he will say to you, enter into my rest, my dear son, my dear daughter. It will be in front of everybody, both the dead, the living, and the yet unborn. Because they all are in him. So what is a miracle? A miracle is a sign. To who? To the unbeliever. <laughs> Not to the believer. The gifts of the Spirit, what are they? Sign gifts to who? To the world, dark world. Everybody breathe in now. Breathe out. You are healed. And then suddenly, with that statement, you find out growths have left. You don't know how they left. You didn't feel any pain. You didn't struggle to birth them, but they left. But you know the authority upon which I said you should breathe in? Because the very atmosphere is filled with his presence. When the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost, he never went back. He remained the atmosphere of this world. So we can safely say now is the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And we together with him shall reign. He's a reigning king. He doesn't need to prove anything. In fact, some of the most powerful messages you will hear will come from invalids or disabled people. As people who are lame or blind. When they share profound truths, it will arrest you who is whole. And you start thinking, my God, how did this person get there in this condition? My excitement is for the end time. The most powerful, valid picture of the end time that I've ever seen, the most glorious moment of the gospel, was not a time for able-bodied men. It was time for broken people. I saw people in hospital beds with drip attached to them. Multiple drugs being pumped into them. Do you understand me? And they were just at the verge of death. And I saw them standing from their beds, unhealed. But because they didn't hinder Jesus, they believed. And they pushed their drip stick and they were managing to walk. And they were discharging other patients from their beds. Most powerful picture of the end time. When the e weak the incapable, the unable, the disabled, take the gospel. <laughs> you know the 11th hour minister, he had been employing everybody from morning, right? Then at the 11th hour, he employed people and asked them, why are you not working? He said, okay, get one eye. Nobody wants carpenter or mason. We get one eye. Because when they put the line, he could say the thing correct. But <laughs> <laughs> By the time they build and finish, you see the wall do the japa. They ask the other one, why you know about good work? You see, as you can see, I did on top board with Boris. I don't get legs, they are ropes. So now with Boris, now the, the best thing I can do is to follow people in traffic. And we say, Mona, help me in the name of God. In the name of God, Mona, help me. God go bless you. Now only mouth I get. But the farm, na rice, did they harvest? Did they use sickle to harvest them? Did they use uh, the rice to tie the bundles? And they carry the bundles to the side. When will I do that? That's why. And Jesus said, I'm employing all of you. One-eyed man. When we were younger, we used to like Chinese films. one arm sword man. We like to, ah, how can one be a man with one arm? Use sword. Take, fight the whole world and kill them. Only Chinese can tell that kind of lie. And we love the lie. One arm boxer. Do you understand me? 
We used to like that. And we were enjoying it. We love, we, I love, there's no film on earth like Chinese film. Chinese film is the only one that tells the real truth. You know why? When Chinese boss, they pursue a person with don't vex him, and you are angry. And you enter the door and lock the door. The Chinese boss, will, the guy will jump the roof so that you continue. I know that kind of anger. That's so anger they be. <laughs> I don't like all this lie, 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 lie film where you try to, you know, especially in Hollywood. No, in Hollywood on the entire Netflix now, so make can cool down. But before, in Hollywood, they go to stand for hospital. Though. Then somebody fall down and fainted. Then they will look at each other. Neka, she has fainted. Then they will say, yes, she has fainted. Then they will look at each other. Shall we take her to the hospital? <laughs> and you the watcher, you know, more than the watchy. <laughs> I said, okay, let's get the ambulance. Ambulance, she's, she fell down by the card desk. Rush her into theater. Abby? Uh -huh. But I like Chinese. When Chinese are angry, they fly in the air and they fight in the air. Oh my God. That's the way we feel when we are really angry. That's also how we feel when we are afraid. When they went to steal mangoes from somebody's farm and the snake that we saw there. The boy that saw the head of the snake, it was a few feet from him. He jumped from there and just said, oh! And started falling. Now, the falling was not the problem. He was running in the air. <laughs> so we didn't need to ask him, what did you see? How does it look like? Which, the language he said is, oh! Which language is that? No language. But if you hear it and match it with the action, you know, oh boy, take off for your life. So we took off. Yes, one day some boys too went to get drunk and they had to pass through a cemetery to go to where the party was. And when they were passing in the afternoon, of course they were existing now. So also people were burying dead bodies and the houses don't need to dig very deep. They just dig a shallow grave and then pile earth on top and then break pots on it. And in the afternoon you are okay. But in the night, they were drunk and they were passing through. And the first two passed, then the other one stopped to urinate. He didn't know he was in the middle of the cemetery. Then he saw a grave that had not fully been covered. Why? He could see some of the white bedsheet. So suddenly, the booze began to leave him slowly. But he was already weeing, so he can't stop. And the friends were standing by the gate of the cemetery. Then he heard something. <laughs> he heard it a second time. He just froze. The urine began to become ice. That's the day I understood the meaning of peace. Be still. As he was standing there, the third time he heard the crrr. You know, fear is wicked. Fear is a painter. How many of you know fear? You can't turn to look, but you can imagine what is being painted. And the thing is approaching you. When he took off from there, the two friends saw him huddling over the gate of the cemetery. The way he passed, they didn't ask questions. They stopped two miles later and said, what did you see? <laughs> My own brother-in-law, his wife woke him in the night. He said, what is it again? She said, thief in our parlor, thief. Then he said to her, how? You know why? They have double doors with iron and with glass in between the iron frames. And then they have two iron bars on each side. And they hook them there. Then he leaves an upside down iron bucket with cans of needle and things. So that if the thief can break every lock, when he pushes this in there, he the thief will run. So he was asked how. Then he stood up, he said, oh, oh, oh. Then when he came to the window to the parlor, he pushed the curtain and saw this black man. Now, thieves in the north then used to go naked and they would tie leather tongue and then rub oil so that if you catch them, they will slip out of your hand. And he saw the man. Now, when he saw a man, black like demon, what he wanted to ask him is, how? 
Did you break the first part? The bucket. Who even told you that I have a bucket with you? You understand what I'm saying? He wanted to ask him that question. He wanted to ask him, are you a spirit or a human being? And he didn't know what language to use. He just said, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And the thief took off. It was fear. Then the wife finally, everything is settled. The wife said, which language? <laughs> That was her problem. He just said, yeah! He didn't know what sound was coming. That's how fear is. Fear paints pictures. That is profound. When you consider the call, the call of God, very profound. It makes men do crazy things, stupid things, insane things they sacrifice dainties pleasure laughter every promise of God remains an illusion a dream until somebody decides to say yes then it becomes real so what is a miracle in the eyes of God? It's actually not the tampering with natural systems and structures and shapes. Do you understand me? That's not what uh, a miracle is, Chintok. A miracle can only be defined by its purpose. And what's the purpose of a miracle? To reveal the pathways of God. There's no miracle Jesus did to show off. He didn't need to. He didn't need to prove that he can supply. So, oh God, prove that you are God, the God of provision, by giving me dinner now. Uh -uh. A mother will give you dinner whether there's any uh, examiner to record the proof of her love for you or not. She will do it. Compassion. It's in her place too. Destroy my enemies so that it will be known. How will it be known that you are my God? Make a distinction between me and the world. No. That's not how he distinguishes himself between you and, you and the world. See, 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 see what he did. What's your name, Shudad? With the glasses. Huh? And she's ready to marry. And she called her names fully. So that in case you catch the vision, you can just know the full names. You know her name and the man you are going to pay. Those are the kind of girls I like. So, My daughter should bring the kind of husband you bring home. He should come with the dowry ready. He knows the receiver and he knows the goods he's collecting. You, you can't marry my daughter. He must build a house for me in Lagos. <laughs> no. Abuja. Then he will buy a house for me. See, Cheta, Cheta is telling himself, oh boy, even if your wife, your daughter, fine like gold, I know they marry him. <laughs> Cowboy, you know, go see from me. But you see, what, what, when Jesus fed the 5,000, do you know what happened there? Jesus didn't break the bread into 5,000 plates and gave them, he just broke the initial, gave to Neka, gave to Vicky gave to Bumi, gave to Busola, and said, keep on doing what I did. So they were the ones that kept breaking. And the bread and the sandwich multiplied in their hands. So when the miracle finished, by that time they were walking like they have put them on a hanger. You know, they were thinking, oh, well, we, we to get more power. Bless you, now we just underestimate ourselves. Do you understand me? They were still thinking like that. When they entered the boat to cross to the other side, and they were wondering how, okay, so if this thing did, why we never eat them before? Why we never feed do like this before in our houses? Are you following me? They were still thinking like that when Jesus came walking on the water, and there was a storm. Now they've just 
broken bread and seen it multiply. 5,000 men, apart from women and children, ate and were satisfied and left 12 baskets of frag frag fragments. But they are now in the boat, straight out of that great victory. And then the boat, the water is boisterous. The boat is sinking and they are frightened. Then they see a man coming and they say it is him. And others say it is not him. And others say it is him. And they begin to scream. It's a ghost. Hey, Mami Water, how can you be in water and you are dying? And then Mami Water again, they inside the water. So, they said some people went to Delta State to go and do ministry. And then they were crossing the river. Super power, super power. Jesus power, super that's how somebody said, Mommy, what? Mm. <laughs> because inside church, we will sing the Mommy, what? Power, powerless power. When he said the Mommy, what? Mm. <laughs> the song died there. The worship ended. Because they are now in the habitat of Mommy, what? So, no singing too much before. <laughs> That's how most of us think that God can be equated. With demons because we don't understand basic things God is the person who has beaten all his enemies all before you came so there is nothing left for him to challenge nothing if you see him you see the word R-E-S-T rest if you see him the day you see Jesus that's what you see. Nobody ever met Jesus that didn't describe his eyes. Eyes like flames of fire. Alive, living flames. So Jesus now says, it is I. And of course, you know what happened next. And then finally, he entered the boat. Now, immediately Jesus entered the boat, the gospel accounts say that the boat immediately came to shore. Ha. What you were struggling with, immediately gave up when he entered the boat. And you were on dry ground, and you could drop and walk. Then one of the gospel accounts says, and the disciples understood the miracle of the loaves. <laughs> What's the connection between feeding 5,000 and then beating the storm and arriving in record time? It was that they suddenly realized, oh boy, you know get power. Now only one person. Yes. So if he is there, yes. all things are possible. Yes. That was what they understood. And he was not contending with anybody. Things naturally bow because he has beaten them down. Only a fool will resist him. The influence of the church. The entire Bible is his story. And his story is wrapped up in one word, church. There's no call greater than church. You can fill a stadium with 50,000 people. Sir, doesn't mean anything. In now in missiology, we also understand that when people say, I made a confession of faith, it doesn't mean they have changed. So we make the distinction between a profession of faith. Do you understand me? And then you are agreeing to work with him. We make a distinction. One great evangelist used to gather whole cities to come and hear him. And it was known that every time he finished his crusades and left, it's like 85 or 90 percent of the people who made the decisions returned. You know, one day I watched Ryan Bonke in Calabar. Another time I watched him in Ibadan. And the last time was when he came to say goodbye to the world. And he did it from Lagos here. In my church in Kaduna, we set up screens and we followed that service every day. After every crusade, I look at the churches on Sunday when you hear that 400,000 people made commitments for God in one crusade. They use satellite imaging to count the hands. I expected that every church will have pandemonium. That the church down the road there that has 
50 members, that 500 will come at least. I expected that the big churches will announce that instead of 50,000 in our 50,000 seater auditorium, we had 500,000 people show up. It never happens. So I wonder how do people make decisions and don't follow up on it. On the other end, there was this other man who was equally an evangelist. Didn't have the same crowds, but it was estimated that 80% of the people who make decisions in his meetings, they continue to serve God for the rest of their life. It's just the content of the ministrations that they were receiving. The emphasis they bought both put. I made up my mind that if you hear me, you don't have to hear me twice. I was a singer, but that was the decision I made. But when you hear me, you don't have to hear me twice. So when you hear me, catch a song. I just want to make Jesus proud. And I just want to make Jesus proud. See, I'll stop at nothing, but I'll rather lay down everything, if only it will make Jesus proud. You can't sing it without disturbing the shrines. It's not possible. Every fake altar of rest must get up. Who is that? Because you are disturbing me. I just want to make Jesus proud. And I just want to make Jesus proud. And you see for this. I'll stop at nothing. But I'd rather lay down my everything. If only it will make. Jesus proud I'll make you proud of me I'll make you proud of me hey, 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 hey. I'll stop at nothing but I'll lay down everything. Tell me why. If only it will make Jesus proud. You can't sing that kind of song and say, Come, come pastor, pastor Bumi, come and show me Jesus. I want to know Jesus. No, as you are singing it, you will see him. Because the song you are singing is one that parts curtains. It's like hands that are opening curtain so that you can see better. Who are you telling? I'll stop at nothing. Are you telling Pastor Chin talk? I'll stop no, at nothing until I make you proud. No, you're talking of Jesus. At that time when you are singing, it's me and you face to face. I'll make you proud. I'll make you proud of me. Oh, 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 I'll stop at nothing, but I'll lay down everything. Tell me why, if it will make Jesus proud. Do you get what I'm saying? Songs like that. They bring you face to face with him. So the miracle of feeding the 5,000 plus the miracle of walking on water, silencing the storm, bringing the boat to its destination immediately. They were not meant to showcase his power. They were meant to teach his nature that where he is, everything bows. Miracles are given so you can teach his nature. The moment you want to have a meeting so you can validate something, Vindicate yourself of something. Let people know that I have succeeded. You have failed. The miraculous only follows you if you want to teach his nature. I can take miracle after miracle after miracle. 
after some miracles Jesus taught. No man lights a candle and keeps it under a bushel. Nor does anybody light a candle and put it under a couch. Two things that have become shrines in the lives of men. They are business, market. They are rest, couch. And Jesus says, when you light a candle, you don't light it so that you can amplify your rest. Neither do you light it so that you can increase your income. There's only one purpose for this light. To lift it up on a high place so that it can cast its beam to the ends of the earth. So it can reach more people. That's what Jesus was saying. Do you understand me? That's why in his own life, he did not exemplify an improved rest or increased resources. With all the things that Jesus did, isn't it surprising that he, the temple could pay his disciple to, to, to betray him? Say, if you pay me very well, someone has to pay me more than what you pay for me to be a traitor, isn't it? But 30 pieces of silver was the price for a slave. And the guy took it. Jesus didn't do any of those things to improve his couch. Yeah, it's a softer. Yes. <laughs> All of them are plastic chair. Me, I get cushion. In fact, my own chair get wheel. If I won't move forward now, I go just roll forward. You know, you you have to stand up and push. No, neither did he improve his accommodation. In fact, his accommodation was so well improved that on the cross, he told John, his favorite disciple, I beg, take care of my mom for me. Let her be your mother. That's the Messiah that we've been called to follow. There's no story of greener pasture. See, let me ask you, where's the direction of heaven? Is he up? They say, we'll go up to heaven. What about down? Which indeed there? Now heaven. What about right? Now heaven. What about left? Now heaven. You see those beans, you say, kai, 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 that cannot be heaven. But the dustbin with his smell. Have you ever been to the dustbin to poo as a little child? You see the mango where you chopped last week, where you dropped for there. When it shot out and became a tender shoot, how did it look? Sublimely beautiful. It didn't resemble the clutter around it. Some of the most beautiful things are in the dirtiest places. Stars shine from where? The dark night. And without the darkness, you will not see the beauty of a star. Have you ever entered a jewel shop? You see diamonds, they cannot be put on a white background because they don't look fine. You have to get black velvet. You drop a diamond there, it just stands out. It's like the black background, the dirty place is what showcases the best things that we have. They ask Kanu Nwanko, how come you and them, JJ and the rest, you, there's something classic about Nigerian footballers. You make the ball do things that nobody imagines. They ask Ronaldo, who is your star? He was pointing to Nigerian stars like JJ. Ronaldinho said, JJ, everybody. So how do you guys do it? Kano said, well, you know, we used to play on the road without shoes. So because of that, you have to make the ball do something so that you can be able to break through. So you just feel like doing, you just do it and then the ball just jumps over the person. And now you see it worked. And Ronaldinho, he actually captured JJ, JJ's moves and sat down and was studying them and did mathematical equation on them on how to you push your leg at angle 65, then lift the ball at that angle, then you match it with the other leg. And then, but the person that originally did it just thought it. He just felt like the ball will move like this if I do like that. And he did it. Natural. And from the trash of Africa. Sadio Mane said, they said, your phone is cracked. It's not even a special brand. He said, well, does he have business for that? He said, if they know where he came from. He doesn't need an iPhone 13, iPhone 19. Instead, he went and built a hospital. Four million dollars. 
for his village. State of the art hospital. Drives a mini Morris. But he put electricity in all of the communities that are tied the road from the village to, I mean, from the head, uh, from the state capital to his village. Do you understand me? Built them ultra modern little markets. And then was putting water all over. And as he's earning, he's investing in more places. So all other communities are waiting for his development to reach them. So he doesn't need to drive a Ferrari. Because he used to play football barefoot. He will go to the farm first and farm. The whole farm before he can come and go and play football. So in Africa, we play football till night. We used to play basketball till nine in the night. Sometimes ten. Because we still can see. You know when you are in the dark, you get used to it. We'll still be shooting hoops. Believing that one day we'll make it to the NBA. You tie the ball around you, put it in between your legs while you are moving in the air. So that was when in playing basketball, I remembered that that boy ran in the air when he saw snake. Because in, in basketball now, you see people like Dr. J and they are moving. They are guards. They are walking in the air. Michael Jordan. Magic Johnson. Do you get what I'm saying? You see Ronaldo jumping four feet in the air taller than everybody in the air and he's slamming the ball into nets. So this, the scare for Ronaldo, Ronaldo if he's your opponent is you don't know what he's going to use to score. Left foot is a blast. Right foot, a blast. With the back heel, a blast. He can play tricks and then when it comes to jumping, he jumps higher than basketball players or as high as them. And in soccer, God does miracles just to showcase his nature. He's a teacher. There's no enemy to prove anything to. He's king of kings and lord of lords. King of glory. He's the king of glory. And he's refined as pure as gold. He's the king of glory. King of glory, and he is refined as pure. And daughter of Zion, hear the word of the Lord tonight. You're being refined to be as pure as gold. Daughter of Zion, hear the word of the Lord tonight. You're being refined. Son of Zion, people of the living God, you're being refined to be as pure as gold. Son of Zion, and the people of the living God, you're being refined to be as pure as gold. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We will rejoice because we are refined as gold. Hallelujah, hallelujah, with everlasting hallelujahs, we will rejoice as we refine the school. On the mountaintop and down in the valley low, you're being refined to be as pure as gold. When the wind is blowing and everything stands still, you're being refined, pure. See, no matter what happens, that's what happens with Jesus. Vicky, John saw him. He said his legs from his knees down were like pillars of brass, but not purified. It was like they were still being purified. He stays in a state of constant purification. You know what he does? It's the understanding, the knowledge. That's your greatest asset. The understanding of who God is. It's your greatest asset. It's your greatest expression. The greatest miracle you can do is to know God. To know Him. That I may know Him. The power of His resurrection. The fellowship of His suffering. Being conformed to the glory of His new 
goodness of life. When you walk up on the mountain top, don't forget that you are being refined as gold. And when you descend down into deepest valleys, never lose sight. gives you bread you reveal his nature when the manna dries you reveal his nature dare to say something like when you're on a hungry stomach he's the only one that can compel attention in the midst of lack his power is more powerful than lack <laughs> let Satan know even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? Fear is not my companion. No, you, you, you don't understand what he was doing there. What he was saying is, faith does not walk alone. Faith does not walk alone. You cannot say, hey, well, I don't know why Bumi did what she did, sir, but... And she knows that I love her. But if, she, if she, she doesn't love me anymore, I don't care. I don't care. And by God's grace, I will make it. I will shall make it somehow. No, that's not faith. When faith is making it, faith doesn't acquire hissing, biting your teeth, shooting your lips as a companion. Faith in the midst of trouble makes a choice. And the choice he chooses for companions of faith is things like peace. They are friends of faith. Peace. Joy. If you are passing through by faith, then show me by your joy. God has said, and I believe that you shout for joy. That's a companion of faith. Not when you are hissing and then still claiming that you are making a confession. No. Even Satan is not deceived. The moment you begin, well, Sha, by the grace of God, some way, somehow, Sha will make it. Amen. I don't even know what God is doing. They say we should pray. We prayed. We fasted. We did all night. And still, no sign. When will God come? <laughs> That's not a companion of faith. When you arrive at faith, you say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. The reason is I have chosen my companion. He is with me. And then his rod and his staff can now comfort me. That's a word of knowledge for someone. You can just get out of there and shake like a masquerade and cast away everything. Cast away dust. I had somebody teaching yesterday about how we must all jackpa because we must locate. For you to excel, you must change location. When you relocate and translocate, then you will locate your uh, uh, dislocated location. And when you are in the right location, everything good will happen to you. Are you joking? Are you joking? Do you know how many children we have lost to the hardest drugs? As I speak, there's a girl. The husband has left. The father is a pastor like me living in the same country. The drug law enforcement agencies called her and showed her their bank account. And she saw the hundreds of thousands of US dollars that entered and left. And then there's a hundred thousand US dollars that he's spending. And they told her they believe that that's his cut. So like a million dollars passed through. What are we doing as a nation? We're hemorrhaging our life. Our youth is our life. Present past and future. Do you think that those who brought the attacks on our nation, that crippled our nation by the wastage of life, do you think the spirit behind them was not intelligent enough to figure out the final conclusion? That they will provoke the church 
to tell her muscle, her life, her creative powerhouse to get out and find greener pastures. What is greener? You get to America. What you will earn is peanuts to the American. Do you understand what I'm saying? And how many people in the diaspora have come back and done something incredible for their country, for their community? When Apollo uh, 11 was landing on the moon, Nigerian scientists were amongst the mathematicians calculating. They've been making millions since. They didn't come back to their village just outside Omoa here. They didn't introduce solar technology here. We're hemorrhaging as a nation. The people prophesying you out of the nation did not tell you that they are the ones that hoisted the government that brought this nation to ruin. So people are not even thinking of repenting publicly to say, oh boy, we are sorry for misleading you people. But that, the authenticity of your prophecy now must be hinged on what you did and said before. You must either rescind it and say, I made a mistake. So now consider me a repentant prophet. In fact, those are some of the people that are coming to power. There are people who will say, I was part of the mess, but I'm here to fix it. Do you understand that? You can't even advise Nigerians with a prophetic, so called prophetic insight when you cannot even talk about the things that have happened to Nigeria in the past three years, four years, five years, six years. Do you know how many people have been kidnapped? Your age. They will kidnap somebody like you, Osola. Then they will call me. Sorry, I don't know what you do. Then they will call me your pastor and say they, they want 15 million for your life. Where are we supposed to get it? Churches are bankrupt because of the number of families they have to bail out. This is a calculated effort to break through the supply of God's people. And there are Christians that are complicit. They are pagans. Christian paganism is the greatest victory of Satan in this end time. And is hinged and anchored on one tactic, deception. It's the most powerful force of Satan at the end time. People are prophesying, leading you into prayer, telling you, try your luck, change location. Which location? God doesn't need your effort to make you what he wants you to be. You sang just now, there's no wall he won't kick down. There's no mountain he won't climb up. There's no shadow he won't light up. Is that true? Somebody even had the guts to say, everybody made any impact, had to leave his land and go to another land and acquire a new technology. Are you alright? Are you for real? Which land did Gawon go to to come back to rule Nigeria? You can say Azikiwe went to America, yes. But go on, go on. He was a nobody, so nobody that Ojuku despised him. That's how the civil war started. When anybody is teaching, stop and listen. If you don't hear him explaining the nature of Christ, that miracle is false. Other streams have to come out that would blaze the trail for life in the spirit. That's the only way out for us as a nation. Your money cannot change anything. How much can you pay for your brother's soul? Can anybody pay anything for his brother's soul? Can by your worry and your calculations and tactics, can you lengthen the length of your hair? I know women, every time they meet other women, they're admiring your hair. Then they start telling you the woe. You enter some bathrooms, you see empty bottles, full bottles, half bottles of all kinds of things. Sold for eight, sold for seven, sold for six, sold for four, sold for three, sold for two, sold for half. The hair is still the same. In the middle here, there's not. It's the rock of Gibraltar. Do you understand? You cannot even improve your height and stature. Some people have eaten vegetables, vegetables alone for six months and they put on more weight. Then they stopped, went back to eating meat. Do you understand what I'm saying? But once he is on your side, who 
can be against you and what can be against you. Instead of the Nigerian church to be forging bound, I mean borders, bridges between the north and the south, until these two come together and kiss and embrace, there's nothing going to change in Nigeria. And how do we kiss and embrace when we leave and present a Jesus that is unhindered? When he finds a people. Can he say to you, empty your pocket? And you are not telling him how. Eh? In fact, by the time service closed now, when I get to Osaka, London, the only bike where if you get now may be 500 or 1,000. Do you know we did it? One day, my friend and I, we were living in Raymond Joku, just by Awolo. And our church was in Rajoba, in the Anaipaja. And there was scarcity of fuel at Bacha's time. Queues were like, we found fuel. One big swan water bottle of fuel. We turned it into the car. We must make this service. God told us. A fever like I'll die. I told the devil, if you are the devil, follow me to communion service. The word of God says that there are two twin edges of a scissors the blood and the, his body. They emasculate life out of Satan every time. If you are a devil, the real devil, follow me. We arrived here in Ipaja. We parked the car. The car, all the seats are iron. The doors, no padding. The car tears jeans if it catches it. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? So the driver, you have to sit and anchor yourself. Some edges, if you enter gallop, you they feel out. So you have to drive well. So nobody, because you will suffer with everybody. So we don't lock it. Area boys don't threaten us. One day I parked in Marina. Then the area boys go, hey, Baba, you want to settle us? You know, I really take care of all this place. Then I, so one of them looks, says, Scorpion, Scorpion, where you come away? They look at the guy, they look at the guy, they look at the guy, they say, Ah, God, if God bless you, may you come back, come bless us. <laughs> because they looked at the car, they knew this, I don't need protection. How are you going to drive it? Car, where did they park on top of the so that you roll it down. Because you know they get people to push you sometimes. So you roll it down and you are holding the wires. And then you match clutch and brake at the same time. You drive it with technology. Your leg, they hold the two. Yeah. Other people when they look at it, they say, Oh, God, why you never move? Now light down, don't grease. <laughs> you are just a man of peace. See what I'm saying? What's the power in the call? What is it that gets people drunk? I want to show you something tonight. Maybe just next 20, 30 minutes. We are close. I was going to say we'll continue tomorrow. I remember that I'm not in Kaduna. It's in Kaduna I do that. We'll continue tomorrow. Then we'll continue next tomorrow. In the afternoon and in the evening. Look at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 verse 1 see the power these are the things that propel people that's what's called church church is the seed of God able to multiply able to stream and circumnavigate the entire earth bring back the knowledge of the Lord in the whole world they said those rivers they circumvented the land of Havila they brought back gold betelium, onyx pure look at he put it on the wall for me. The high priest asked, are these accusations true? Who were they asking him? Stephen. What were they asking him? They said he blasphemed God and the temple. Who had they asked that question to? Jesus. When Jesus affirmed that these were true, what happened to him? He died. So Stephen knew exactly what they meant. Are these things true? Then see what Stephen said. Stephen replied, my fellow Jews. No, don't give me the passion translation. Give me a simple translation. New King James. 
See, the problem is when you read the Bible in the Passion for the first time, you, you don't know it. You have to read it in the old translation, the standard translation. Then you can now read the paraphrase ones. Then it will make sense. Do you understand me? Do you understand me? Don't be in a hurry to say by the, and the message translation like you are trying to show like you know. This, the Bible, they know they show they know. Look, how many of you read novels by a common author? Maybe James Hadley Chase, Harold Robbins, Mills and Boons. Good. The girls read them. If you read Mills and Boons, you had to read it from cover to cover. Sometimes five times. Because you want, when the girls begin to debate, you want your information to be impeccable. This girl is a wicked girl. We were talking this morning about breakfast. And I said to her, this is Abraham and da da da. She said to me, Pastor, how did you know that thing you said now? Where is it in the Bible? Do you know everything I'm saying to you? I cross-checked it before coming. Just because of that stupid question. You understand me? Some people are just, they are, they are like demons sent to terrorize you. She just asked me that question. No, no, I, and the question was good. Though. Three years ago, I had, I'd, I've been teaching the church for over 10 years. I heard a senior man of God say that if you are called, one of the scourges of ministry is the wrong wife. That are women and, and ministers. So all of us agreed that every pastor's marriage must have trouble. Me, I've had my own fair share of trouble. We were separated my wife for three and a half years before we came back together. Do you understand me? Others are living in the hell. And as some people just say, now, wow. So it didn't happen for even higher places. He's a man with respect. We didn't cross check. Then he turned around and said, even Moses, his wife gave him trouble. She didn't follow him to Egypt. Don't you know that he faced Pharaoh alone? Where was his wife? Until the goodies came in, then she and her father came. And they came to enjoy. We didn't cross check. I taught it for almost 15, 18 years. Three years ago, one day, I was going to the church to teach them. And the Lord said, read Exodus. So I put it and I was playing it and I was traveling out from going. Pigeon translation. Then I heard. Now in Moses carrying wife and in Pekins, now you come to travel, go Egypt. May you go face Pharaoh. I said, eh? I stopped the car. It's not possible. Moses carrying wife and in Pekin and he go to go meet Pharaoh for Egypt. I said, it's not in the Bible. Then I took the King James Version read it. And Moses took his wife. I read the New King James. And Moses took his wife. I read High House of Bible. Say Musa, they had to give my attention. <laughs> so I came to church. I said, excuse me. This teaching ministry is overrated. I said, many of the times I've been lying to you people. Today, I'm publicly, I said, put it on Facebook. Put, put, don't quench the camera. Do you understand me? Then this year, yeah, woman, sit down with me. I said, me chop breakfast. I said, no go chop. I think she did save me money. I don't know if she did plan to shoot me with her. I said, Pastor Chris, where did you see that? Thing? So I went and cross checked it. Now I'm waiting for her. But everything I'm going to say today, I want us to read it. And he said, what? Brethren and who? No, no, listen, listen. Who was he addressing? The Sanhedrin. What was the highest council in Israel? The Sanhedrin. Who did you fear the most? The Sanhedrin. Who killed God? So Stephen was there. Even Paul cursed the high priest. They said, eh? He said, sorry, I didn't know it was the high priest. Even himself quickly lied that he didn't know. Because he knew that they had the power of what? Life and death. These are not the people that Stephen can normally address. He can't stand in their presence. When he stands, his legs will be knocking. And he called them what? Brethren and fathers. He separated them. 
Some of you are my mate. Others now be our fathers. But he addressed them in their uniform. Brethren and fathers. Hear what he said. What did he say? The God of who? Appeared to our father Abraham when he was where? In Mesopotamia. Before he dwelt in Haran. No, no, no. Wait, wait. A simple story there. The God of who? What did he look like? No, Bumi, stand up. You are wearing gold. Is that how the God of glory looked? That when the lights fell, they were shimmering on the gold. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sit down. What about Vicky? Stand up with your left hand lifted up. Uh -huh. Is it your golden watch? Do you understand me? Is that how the God of glory looked like? What did he look like? Sit down, ma. Whatever he looked like compelled a 75-year-old man to go to nursery school. Oh, no, no, no. You don't get me. Call is not what you choose. Call is not what you allocate to yourself. It's something you can't even call it. You don't know what it is. It is something. How many times have you heard people say, and something told me not to follow that road? Is that thing? It's a compulsion. He called him who? The God of glory. He appeared to him where? In Mesopotamia. But he appeared to him as who? The God of glory. Before he dwelt in Haran. Haran is the location he was told to go to. I put puts paid to every technology that is being sold as Jaqua is a lie. Before he got there, God already made him who he was. Oh my God. He has finished the work in your life. Then he comes to start. You are only unraveling what God has already done. Before he dwelt where? In Haran. Where the wonders were to begin. Before he landed there, the word of God had made you entire. That's what makes mad men and madder women. Look at Chintok. Look at his wife. Who is madder? Chintok is mad. And when you hear him, Jesus, I can tell you. Make girma, make girma. Oh, Lord. And she's acting like she's cool. But it's a cool madness. She's madder than him. Because he's mad that went. But she's madder that followed. Of Jesus unhindered. What is Jesus unhindered? I have come to take off the bricks from Jesus. You can go anywhere you want, whenever you want, however you want. Disregarding me. <laughs> Only donkeys do that. A beast of burden. One of the biggest rock bands in the world, you know, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. They sang a song, I don't want to be a beast of burden. And he went to number one. Because nobody wants to be a beast of burden. I'll never, never, never want to ever be a beast of burden. Is sold to number one everywhere in the world. Because everybody hates it. How many girls have I pastored who will tell me, Pastor, I cannot suffer in my father's house and go and suffer in another man's house. The man better go and get ready and have some kulele before I follow him. Monkey? Sorry. I'm on television. Do you understand me? How did your mother follow your father? I produced you. He had nothing. She went by faith. Every journey is done how? By faith. Whether you believe in Jesus or not. That's why when you meet him, there's no part of you that can deny his lordship. You will stand and tell him the truth. I tell you, look, no man, do you know, some people don't want to be close to God because they think if I remain ignorant of his teachings, when I go there, I say, ah, I didn't know. They say, why? I say, ah, I didn't read the Bible and nobody told me. They think they will escape. No, Jesus will punish ignorance. Every day Jesus meets an ignorant man or woman. He punishes her. You know what? It's the worst crime for you to remain ignorant of him because the entire you, your life, was crafted in his image. And for you to reject his knowledge meant you didn't care to know who you were. And it's an abhorrent, abominable, ignominious 
insult to his person that he created you. You are a misnomer. He dwelt in Mesopotamia. What's Mesopotamia? It's a land. But it's a land that is overshadowed by two rivers. Just like Nigeria. The Euphrates and the Tigris overshadows those two lands. This is a land well supplied for. Had water. Had everything. Do you understand me? So no reason for you to leave it. And somebody is telling you that there's every reason for you to leave your own Nigeria. And the reason is not hinged on God whatsoever. Then look at the next verse. Read it for me. Huh? No, let me just open my own so that I'll read with you. Exod um, sorry, is it Exodus? Acts. Acts chapter 7. Good. Okay. Before he lived in Haran. So, Vicky, before you see Jesus unhindered materialize. Do you understand me? I have made you. That's what the scripture means. He has made you everything that you were not yet. When the things that were to verify and affirm that calling were not even yet present, he had already made you everything qualified for. The songs you sing, the position you stay in, the you know, your commitment, the violence with which you pursue it, they had already been crafted in you before you set your foot on the land to which he sent you to. Some of you ought to, by this, know that you're in the right place. Because there's nothing to show for it yet means you're in the right place. His word makes you the future, the present, and the past at once. His word. And that's the message to teach. Look at what he said in verse 3. What does he say? Then he what? Huh? Oh, and said to him, what? Chintok, how do you say get out when you're angry? Did you think the person that said get out here was at peace? Huh? It's the call. He said to me, the reason for which I apprehended you is that a nice word? Do you tell, if your husband tells you tonight, P.I., you know why I apprehended you is so that you will hatch me six boys. Will you go and buy him a drink? He dare use the word apprehend to me. Even if he was preaching at the highest point of his preaching, when lame legs were sh shooting out, then he said, when I apprehended my wife, hallelujah, somebody. Who is going to answer hallelujah? Everybody there. Uh, mm. You remember that Mami Otazo story? Mami uh, mm, mm. Do you understand me? Look at what God said. No, if you don't hear it, you won't understand the power that drives people in insane directions, contrary to the places that they want to go to. God didn't say, come out to a land which I'm about to show you and then I'll make you a blessing to all the nations. God said, get out! That's the only explanation that will make a 74 turning 75 year old man to get up and go to nursery school to go and learn God. That's the only way. There's no other explanation. No other explanation. Read the Bible now and wake up. This is what he said to him. Get out of your country and from your relatives. That means it's like run away from them. There's nobody has ever obeyed the call of God that didn't pay a price. Relatives suffered. You know, relative, everything close to you. That's why I said to you, every step that you take in this walk, you're being refined till your spirit has gone. Right now, it doesn't make sense, but at the end, you will find that you look like him, pure as gold. 
Not just pure as gold, but like gold that is still being purified. Because Jesus is not holy alone. He is holy, but he's still being holified. It is a word like that. Get out! Sin talk. Say it! Chatter. See you. Can they say it? Get out! That's it. You get the past. I mean, the passion, the fire, the tension. You, you must match it. Everybody say, get out! Get out! That, that's, that's what God said to Abraham. That, that he told me, he said, get out or I heard my mother. I saw her holding a big iron. And all she was asking me to do is drop that piece of meat that you stole from the pot. When I looked at the meat, I felt the taste to my stomach. I said, it's not compared to this blow. So I dropped it and I said, sorry. I became a gentle lamb. Do you understand me? By compulsion. Get out! from your country, your relatives, and do what? Come that. And what did he say in the next verse? Then he no, is that what he did? Then he that's it. As God said, get out, Abraham came out. Have you pulled catapult? When you pull it to the end and you release it, how will the stone go? they beget violence. Don't act like you know it all. If you have never heard it in your life, just act like, man, this is new. Get up on your feet, kneel down, lie down, because you have thought you were a madman just because of the way you obey God. But you didn't realize it was a rebuke that brought you out. Just as I am And then you are walking down to the front because the song sounds mellow and the keys are melancholic it does not hide the violence it was a rebuke that got you it was telling you that moment is you get out of there what are you doing you think i'm your mate then you stood up and you started walking that is why no devil could put you stud for you to fall when you were walking to the front because the rebuke silenced them do you understand that? When you were pushing your hand up, it was power that punctured the atmosphere. I told you that when a corn breaks out, what do you see? An earthquake. The cracks in the ground is an earthquake. They said Jesus was talking to the demoniac at, at Gadara and, and the demoniac had spoke to him from the ground. You know why? Because Jesus had rebuked him and the word of the Lord bound him, held him on the ground with all the demons inside. The demons used to empower him to break iron. They used to empower him to crack stone. With his bare hands, he killed men. Nobody went near the, 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 the tombs. Only he roamed there. But the word of the Lord picked him up, pinned him to the ground. With all the legion of demons in him, he spoke to Jesus from the dust. I love the name Jesus Unhindered. Exciting. Shinto came to church one day and he began to shout. He said, I know what will happen in 2022. is the year of Jesus everywhere, for everybody, at every time. Not all this silly prophecy. The year 22 is going to be the year of double tutu. Double tutu. So the next year will be the year of one two and then one three. That makes you a real prophet. Then 2026 will be the year of two and six. Two and six. You know, before two shillings, six pence. So are we going forward or backward? Friend, if you have nothing to say, shut up. But if you want to hear, hear the word of the Lord. There is a command. Nobody called of God goes to ideal places. The call of God doesn't take you to ideal places. 
the call of God takes you to contrary places. The redemption of Nigeria lies with the messianic generation who have been told in the heat of fire, out of the ashes of my dying today, what do you see? I see the breaking of a brand new day in which the name, in which the name of the Lord alone is glorified. What do you see? That's where Messiahs are. The Messiah doesn't escape the fire so then he can bring redemption to the people in the fire. The Messiah remains in the fire. That's why Jesus himself took his cross and went out, hung on the hill outside the city. Then now he says to us, carry your cross, leave the city and follow me. There's no ideal place for a Messiah. The challenges Satan brings your way, are they ideal? Does Satan touch you in places you can reach normally? That's why you need the Holy Ghost, the anointed horn of the unicorn. Then he can find wherever the devil is, between spirit and soul, between joints and ligament, between body and bone, flesh. Anywhere the devil hides it, only that horn of the unicorn can reach it. Now listen, what did he say again? Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived where? And after his father died, God, eh? God, God. I want you to see it now. Come to me. You heard it, so you said the force. Come quickly, quickly. Let me, let me demonstrate it. Turn around and face that side. Face Kyle. They said, and God what? Moved him. Did you hear that? Most of us think that is a call. The call means hey, let's um, advise each other. In fact, you know he's doing good. Though. He's smoking is bad. Is that the gospel? If the person, if the person could stop it, won't he stop it? If every virgin that lost her virginity could, won't she put it back? That's why I attempt. Pushed him. The English standard version said God removed him from there and transported, put him. And the places they were pushing him to is the will of God. If they push you like that, what will you say? Don't you turn around and say, who is that idiot? Don't you know I can injure myself? Is that not what you will say? Even if you don't say it with your mouth, you'll say it in your heart. Because that push is reckless. But that's how God moves. So when you are singing, oh, the reckless love of God. No, don't sing it thinking it's ice cream. The reckless love of God is when he wants to fix you. Pushing, removing, get out, getting out, in, bringing into it. He's doing all those things. We celebrate the men who start visions to which you have access to. So you can find bread. Celebrate them. You know why? You will have to celebrate them in eternity. Even if you don't do it here. God moved him from there into this land in which you are now living. That's what visionaries do. They carry land for others to live in in different ages. <laughs> so we should be careful not to add any burden to anybody who God has used to make a way for you. Oh my God. I feel goose pimples all over. Every time I read this portion of scripture, it's a new beginning. Then, hear what God said. God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. God had already promised him this land in P.I. But what did he say in the next verse? Verse 6. Verse 5, sorry. God did 
didn't give him an inheritance in it. Not even. So what, what about all the teachings about asset management and all of this and all of that? You will have so much to do. God, from before he left home, go back and read it. God told him what was going to happen. I'm going to give you a land which you will possess for an inheritance to your children's children. Are you following me? I was shocked when I read Moses' because of how the trouble she gave me today. I still went and listened to Exodus again. When God was sending Moses, while God was sending him, he was telling him what he would do with Pharaoh. He even told him how they would leave Egypt. And every man and every woman will ask his neighbor. I mean, God is calling a man and telling him the treasure that he's going to have when he's leaving Egypt. He has not left the mountain to even go home and tell uh, Jethro. He had already seen what will happen. How loaded they will be. And then you can imagine carrying that vision. And then watching the vision scatter. The moment he told Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, okay, because of that, don't give them straw. But they must meet their daily targets. He doubled their burdens. Every time you proclaim the word of the Lord, things go bad. Your best people go into drugs and they are irretrievably lost. Things happen to question and challenge the veracity of your word. That's why most of you don't want to obey the, the call. You know why? Because you know it's going to task you. What's the next verse? How do you promise me land and you don't permit me to buy even one foot? I saw some stupid girls just kill the visions of God. Because you say, I love you, I love you. They say, hey, let us start business now so that we can also have assets. So we have 600,000. Let's buy keke. Then that keke will produce um, 1.8 million in nine months if we are collecting three, 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 three hundred per day. Do you understand what I'm saying? Have you ever seen it? salted groundnut. And boys like us and Chintok, when we come from the north, the first thing we want to buy in traffic, uh, bring groundnut, epa, epa. You want to eat salted groundnut. We farm the groundnut in the north. We ship it here. The only difference is that you added salt. We can also cook and add salt. But we call it Lagos groundnut. And people are hurrying. My family, as we enter traffic, they will say, um, what's that black? Why not? Why not? Why not? I said, you people are disgracing me. People will soon see Pastor. Say, ah, Pastor Chris. Ah, you didn't buy Why not? My family doesn't care. My family believes that Why not cures leprosy, broken bone, menstrual cycle, uh, barrenness. They believe it. They will be telling me that I'm missing out. Meanwhile, when they are sick, it's my money. They will go to hospital with Why not? No work. Do you understand me? Some people, we too, when they leave Lagos, as they are landing the north like this, there's one thing they are looking for. And it's just a common thing. Do you understand me? There's no ideal place for God to operate. His call is a new land. <laughs> when he calls you, you lift your leg onto a new land. New land! new land that responds to a different law is the law of an endless life new lands that are an order new land that will turn stones to bread dry lands to fruitful I mean fields of water new land you don't know God when you still talk about your strategies, your tactics, as though they are the ways of God. If God needed you to be so strategic, then why will he be God? This is the life. 
What's the next verse? Yet he gave him no inheritance. Not even what? A foot's length. But promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him. Although at this time he had no child. I came to open wombs tonight. Not wombs of biological children. But wombs of that which will bring the biological came on purpose to unlock for you new eyes, new vision, new paths, new channels. And not only to open it for you, but to commission you to be an eye opener to generations born and unborn. I also raised you as a consolation of that which is past. So that fathers who died had broken can have their hearts healed in the grave. I heard the word vendor. I came to raise vendors who will sell the law of life. I make you a vendor. Instead of Guardian newspaper, you'll be shouting free life, new life, new lands, vision. followers of those who through faith and patience. What is faith? Faith is not bold face. Most of us think is I made up my mind. I will make it. I didn't come to Lagos to look at bridge. Everybody says the same thing. Faith is emulating him.
told me, you're not going to travel. Ten years, I was looking for a visa. <laughs> Every day I go to the embassy, will bounce me. One reason after the other. Business papers, correct. The people I'm going to buy things from, they are there. The people I'm supplying here are here, waiting. Nothing I didn't do. I got recommendations from NDs of big companies that I was supplying. After four trials, five trials, I just dropped the passport and I sat down. Nothing moved till 1999. He woke me up himself and said, I proved my word to you. You know one of the words he proved? That time we were separated with my wife, Pierre. I will drive recklessly. I will take a car from Kaduna and drive to Lagos. I will leave Kaduna 9, 10 in the night. Taxis have already gone. Then I will start flying at 150, 160, 170. Just to leave. We'll arrive at Tollgate Ibadan at the same time. I just wanted to die. But death wasn't coming. We'll meet armed robbers. Everybody will pack. I'll come with a bowler, bowler hat, cowboy boots, and I'll gas my car and take off. They'll shout, hey, one he bomb, one he bomb. He has gone, he has gone, he has gone. Cowboy, hey! I don't get any gun. I was just looking for death in the name of a call. Na callu, then bring me wahala. Then we'll enter Lagos. Then I'll drive around Lagos, find a place, lie down in the car and sleep. That time there was a chimpanzee at Palm Grove, near the Palm Grove Estate Gate. And your favorite place, I'll lie down there and sleep. And then when I wake up, I go to Yapa, eat, greet a few people, go back and sit down with Meshai. When the cars begin to leave for the north again, I'll let them go. Then I'll play catch up. And one day, as I was Two, three hours away from Kaduna after Kutu I was driving up north. Then I looked to the right and there was some sight I normally see but I ignored. You know the sight? The sky was orange. London's burning, London's burning. I remembered the song. I was standing in Liverpool Street just by the station. McDonald's was beside me and the Lord was saying to me the reason for which I apprehended you is not in this land it's at home so in the call he showed me the location it was the refinery fires of Kaduna they lit up the sky exactly what I saw in London but I didn't understand it I've never taught it because when you even find those things Bumi, they are sacred you can't teach them until you find a company. I told her, I said, these are the people I came for. They must be brand new people in their believism of Christ. So I want to share my nuggets with a hungry people, a worthy people. I want to share it. That's how the call is. Compelling. You know when I saw that, my spirit recognized it, but my mind was slow in catching up. And I came already. I was in the soup already. Ruptured dreams. So my marriage was no more. Everything. Just because I believe Jesus. Why don't things just gel when you believe Jesus? Why? Why does it seem that unbelievers who fight him have everything going for them? Even David said it. So it's not a new situation. It's an ancient demonic situation. He said, when I consider the wicked and their end, how glorious it is, I get upset. He said, then I came to the sanctuary. It's only in the sanctuary that you can see a different vision. He said, and I understood. What did he understand? That I am the apple of his eye. I am the joy that's in his heart. My life is engraved upon the palms of his hands as his guide shows me in the way. He's guiding me safely.
through storms and mountains and valleys guiding me. Always help. My life is secure where in his hands. Always. Why? Because he's guiding me safely. When rocks are ripping the bottom of your canoe and everything in you wants to say, my end don't come up, my own don't finish up, that's when you lift up a praise unto him. Guiding me safely so you see young people now they go and learn the keyboard they go and learn the drum they go and learn the guitar and then they begin to shop for the ministry that can handle them do you understand there you are, they dally they have to come and bribe you they say ah no 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 no, I can't take that rubbish man you can't be talking to me like that how much are they giving me after all, that other ministry there, upstairs ministry, international, worldwide, wherever man is found, they are, they are ushers, collect 70K. Talk less of me, where could they lead worship? Ah, amen. In vain do men prepare a horse for the day of battle. Where is safety? So I'm excited. I love you. I'm proud of you. You held this horse. Jesus, when he died. Ride on in majesty. Let your hands do fierce and terrible things. Win victories that only you can win. Let me be your donkey. That's what Jesus and Peter did. Everybody in the Bible was a picture of a church. Jericho. There was a prostitute. She lived on the wall. The city was earmarked by God for destruction. A prostitute. She was no good. But she hid the spies. She said, I've been waiting. I've been compiling reports of the things your God did. And I came to the conclusion, if he can destroy Egypt, tear the Red Sea, feed you for 40 years, and the food made your cloth to be renewed. Do you understand me? Your legs did not blister. That is the God I will serve. But the king of Jericho, did he have the same reports? He did. He's the head of intelligence. So who was gathering intelligence on their movement? The men in Jericho. Say, if God could do those things and he promised you this land, I've chosen sides. I'll be on your side. So when you inherit this land, I will continue with you. That's what she said. What have you done with the reports of God? What have you done? Some of you are so restless tonight. And yet, the anthology of the things God has done in your life will fill every encyclopedia in every reference library in the world and much more. You are a compendium of all the good that God has to offer morning by morning. You can see it more than Jeremiah. New mercies I see. Great is thy faithfulness. But you are restless, in pain. You get a hundred thousand, you hiss. Then the Lord now blesses you. You make a million, you are still hissing. He gives you ten million, you are still hissing. When somebody talks about thanksgiving, they have to explain to you for hours why you should give thanks. Who are you? You are deeper than hell. Come out from amongst them. Be ye separate. Let him purge you. I came back to Nigeria since 1990. The country was now disintegrated. The people asking you to go, are they going? I did your pain. They're asking you to leave the land so they can possess it. It's a legitimate way of rigging. When we send you out, then we can, they will calibrate an election and all your votes will be accounted for. But you didn't vote. It's rigging. And then more so, now is the time God wants to populate the land. 
with firebrand ministries. He gave me a mandate to drop 30 churches in Kaduna State. I've started two. <laughs> Unique locations. Everywhere that's been bombed. Every nation. You know, we thought nation is Nigeria. You don't know that the Owu is a nation. Eh? You don't know the Eba is a nation. You think every Ijebu is the same? I remember going to Ijebu Ipo and all the students from Ago Iwoye. That's where they were getting the most levels. And today, there's hardly any one of them that didn't become a pastor or a pastor's wife. <laughs> what was the nature and scope of the ministry? Liberian refugees were there then. We invaded that camp like fire. We met militants in the Delta. They caught the fire. One, one, his name was Boy Busy. He spends his time busy just killing people. He killed his senior brother for the brotherhood to receive him. He killed his senior brother. It was Christ that fled. He, he told me, he said, Jesus can never forgive him. No altar can ever forgive him. He can't even face his mom. And he received Christ. He became an evangelist. One of the toughest Osama bin Laden said, that man, where they sing that song there, I'll tell and say, I want me to come. Let they arrange for me to come. He was the only one I didn't see face to face because God took me to other fields. You are too young not to have exploits under your belt. It's silly. Some of, you, some of us never have sat with the Bible once from Genesis to Revelation. We're still teaching, and pastor's wives usually give them problem. Oh, Moses went to Egypt without his wife. We're still teaching it. Because nobody has had the guts to ask us, did you, where did you read it? And some of us have, even when we found that we were wrong, we did not have the courage to come back to say, you know what, I taught that thing wrongly. This is the call of God. It's the thunder of his call that releases you, shoots you out shoots you out. It's not you that propels yourself. Yeah. I'm captivated by the thunder and the lightning of your word. That is why it's my Oh, take me deeper into the heights of glory where the eyes Never seen. I'm captivated by the thunder and the lightning of your word. That is why, is why I walk in. Every word you speak is life, and every breath just revives my soul. Take me deeper 